Victorian. It's an adjective that has a lot of different meanings and represents the secure and profitable era of Queen Victoria, who ruled in England from 1837 to 1901. The 19th century is often seen as sort of the peak of British imperialism and progress. And it's not just the expansion of colonies and a shift in how those colonies are set up and monitored and ruled, but also the expansion of the ideological framework of imperialism. You might have heard the phrase that the goal was to have the sun rise and set on the British Empire. And it really is very remarkable how far this one country um, impacted the rest of the globe. As we've seen before, there's a mixture of economic, political, and religious motives. And one of the phrases that you probably have heard and is pretty embedded in our notions of what um, colonial narratives are about is to take civilization to the heathens. And that has, civilization has both religious as well as intellectual and political and social implications as well. It's an interesting area, era, and we can explore it much more broadly, but we're going to focus in today on um, just what some of the strategies were there and the changes and how that impacted Nigeria. I love these two pictures here as sort of symbolic of both the formal setting up of someone like Queen Victoria as the Empress of India in 1876, um, the idea of empire building. But it's also very clear that this is not just a collaborative development strategy, but one of dominance and subservience. We'll see in Things Fall Apart that the values and beliefs of this era are taken into different areas, religious through missionary, um, strat missionary efforts, cultural through education, um, economic and political as well. As I mentioned last week, part of what brought the colonial era to the, an end was World War II. And clearly that had physical implications. Um, the many parts of Great Britain were bombed by Germany and um, as a result infrastructure was devastated. A lot of people, primarily men, died during World War I and World War II and so England found itself with a shortage of labor. And there was an effort I think in general to emphasize local over global initiatives. And so as a result, there was kind of a contraction. But there was also an expansion of ideas of socialism, of providing access and opportunity to a range of people in a range of classes and for um, government resources to be made available to a lot of different people. Another part of this in an economically strapped Britain was the cost of colonial administration. Um, as well, and so as they took on some new approaches, they were clearly influenced by the democratic ideals of America, who had played a big role in World War I and World War II, as well as sort of this model of economic opportunity that could happen through the democratic capitalist project. Another factor influencing the decline of colonial power and that imperialist strategy was the formation of the United Nations after World War II. It was a recognition of a global community and the need for collaboration and not having that particular kind of world war, as they called it, again. Built into that was an element of national accountability, how a country interacts with other global communities and for what purpose and there was a strengthening of human rights protections that was not that um, was not pre present at all um, in the 18th and 19th centuries and earlier. One of the things that is also evident in post-colonial literature then is some, kind of this relationship of these countries post-World War, the colonized countries, back to what's called the mother 
country. Um, a good example of that is the Windrush, Windrush boat that brought people from Jamaica, the West Indies, and imported people who were part of British colonies, who were considered British citizens, and brought them back to a European home to serve as labor, to set up and strengthen the economy and the infrastructure. And that happened in June of 1948. One of the promises was that they would be given documentation so that they would now be British citizens in the UK, in London. Many of them settled in a neighborhood that's now very well known called Brixton. Um, and the immigration crisis continues, or the immigration struggles continue, as um, most recently they found out that some of the documentation of the people who were brought and came over in the 1940s and early 1950s, a lot of that documentation had been destroyed uh, for a variety of reasons. And some of those people from this era who had been brought intentionally by the British government have now been deported. So it's been a really interesting um, conflict in England today. And you'll see um, if you do some research in contemporary British colonial um, enterprises, you'll see some elements about the Windrush generation as well. This whole era of post-World War II is often referred to as decolonization. And it's important to recognize that these happen very, very differently. Some are peaceful, some are bloody, some are violent, and um, some are Pro, like progressed over a, a period of time and had varying degrees of rule as in India and some were very abrupt um, divisions and throwing off of a given of a given country and establishment and the majority of the col colonies um, post United States are set up, set, up, set up as republics within the Commonwealth and they have a self-governing um, structure with loose affiliation with the mother country. They're called Commonwealth countries. Um, in the 1940s, that happened for Canada. Um, in 1947, India. 1950s through the 80s, many African colonies, including Nigeria, um, were maintained, attained their independence. And in the 1960s on, many Caribbean and West Indian colonies also established their autonomy. And they they vary in their relationship, their governing relationships and their economic agreements with um, the home country of Britain. This is another um, YouTube that gives a slightly different one, but I'd love you at the end as you're sort of trying to get a bigger picture of what this colonial trajectory looks like. This is one that uh, Ollie Bai published just the day after. Uh, published just the day after he published the other one, and it's tw almost 20 minutes long, and it's really, it's got a better um, indication, I think, of time periods marked, and so I'm going to just show you a couple of those, and again, the music is very dramatic and represents sort of the ideology of the creator, but I'll show you just a couple points. <laughs> Four twenty one gives us kind of an idea of the early expansion. And one of the things I like about this one is it also talks about the different types of language that was used for these different ter territories, like constituents, colonies, there might be occupation, there might be company rule. There's a lot of different possibilities. The late 1600s, you can see this expansion into the British colonies. In the mid 18th century, you can sort of see how things are changing over time and India is expanding towards the east. But you'll see here that moves from a colony to occupation to nothing in there. And you'll see princely states and again, company rule as well. beginning of the 19th century starts showing this expansion into India expansion here as well 
And then as you move through time here, you'll also see this increase and even greater. And then also note here, sort of the different kinds, there's claims and occupations, special cases, protectorates, lots of different options. And then by the time you get to the end, you can see how things have moved into this Commonwealth members and overseas territories. And even that shrinks over time until you get down to this very small area with the Commonwealth. So I think that's a, I just think that's a very interesting overview and one that's interesting for you to think about.